Hello, I'm George Weigel, the author of Witness to Hope and the End and the Beginning, uh, both published by Vydrodza, the publishing house of the Polish province of the Order of Preachers, the Dominicans, good friends of mine, and I'm happy to speak to you on behalf of Vydrodza today. Uh, over some 35 years of thinking about and studying Pope St. John Paul II, writing two volumes of biography about him, I have come to think of him as a man with a very rich interior life, uh, something like a multi-layered cake. Uh, and I think of him as having many different souls, all wrapped into one great soul, and it's those different aspects of the soul of Pope St. John Paul II that I'd like to speak about uh, here. In the first place, I would say Pope John Paul II had a Polish soul, uh, by which I mean a soul formed by a particular historical experience. Uh, as you know, uh, here in Poland, for 123 years, between 1795 and 1918, the Polish state uh, disappeared from the map of Europe, uh, having been eaten uh, by the great powers of the region, Russia, Prussia, and uh, Austria. And yet over those 123 years, the Polish nation survived the loss of the Polish state and survived with such vigor, such vitality, that it could give birth to a new Polish state in 1918. How did that happen? It happened through culture. It happened through a distinctive language. It happened through a distinctive literature, uh, plays, poems, novels that kept alive the idea of Poland. And it happened through Poland's faith, through its Catholicism. The Catholic Church became a kind of safe deposit box, a repository of Polish national identity during those 123 years of exile from the map of Europe. What young Karol Wojtyla learned from that, and what defined his Polish soul, if you will, is that culture is the main engine of history over time. Not politics, not economics, not some combination of, pol of politics and economics, but culture. What people cherish, what people worship, what people are willing to stake their lives and their children's lives on. Out of that culture-first view of history, Wojtyla also learned that the church, the gospel, is still the most potent, powerful offer available in the world today. So the church has no reason to be on the defensive. Uh, the church offers the world an understanding of the human condition uh, that is grander, nobler, uh, more conducive to human flourishing and social solidarity than anything else. So the Polish soul of John Paul II gave him a particular confidence in the ability of the church to speak to the modern world, the postmodern world, and whatever is coming after the postmodern world. Secondly, I would say that John Paul II had a, Mar a Carmelite soul. During the Second World War, uh, young Karol Wojtyla, then a manual laborer in Krakow, was introduced to the great classic works of Carmelite spirituality, the works of St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa of Avila, by a layman, a man named Jan Tiranowski, uh, himself uh, an autodidact, a self-taught teacher in these great works of Christian spirituality, uh, a man who had taken over at the request of the remaining priest at Wojtyla's parish what we would call today youth ministry or university ministry under the Nazi occupation. Tiranowski must have intuited that this literarily inclined young man, Karol Wojtyla, would be interested in the poetry of St. John of the Cross, the diaries and writings of St. Teresa of Avila, her autobiography, 
So he began to feed Wojtyla these classics of Carmelite uh, spirituality. From that, Wojtyla learned something that would be very important for the rest of his life. The cross is the center of history. The cross of Christ is the axial point around which the human story turns. It's through the cross that we come to Easter. It's through Good Friday that we come to Easter. And in the passion, death, resurrection, and ascension of the Lord Jesus, history was turned back to its proper course or trajectory. The cross is at the center of history. Something else Wojtyla learned from the classic Carmelites is that self-gift, not self-assertion, is the royal road to human flourishing, happiness, and ultimately beatitude. As each of our lives is a gift to us, none of us is the cause of our own existence, so we are to make our lives into a gift for others. That was more than a biological fact. We are not the cause of our own existence for Carol Wojtyla. Well, he would later develop that philosophically into what he called the law of the gift, the law of self-giving. That law of the gift was built into humanity from the beginning, and the truth of it was confirmed in the life, death, and resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is, of course, a profoundly countercultural notion in the Western world today, which teaches us that asserting ourselves is the way to fulfillment. Uh, Wojtyla understood something different, and his Carmelite soul was a soul formed by the idea that making ourselves into a gift for others is the way we come to the fulfillment uh, of our own uh, destinies. Third, I would say that Carol Wojtyla had a Marian soul. Now, we know about his great devotion to Our Lady, uh, his Episcopal motto, which later became his papal motto, totus tuus, I am entirely yours, an active dedication to the Virgin Mary. But this was more than the conventional Marian piety or devotion in which he grew up. In fact, if we read Wojtyla's uh, vocational memoir, Gift and Mystery, he tells us that when he uh, came to Krakow as an 18-year-old uh, to begin his studies at the university, uh, the Agalonian University, he was dissatisfied with the conventional Marian piety with which he had grown up in, in Vadovica. Uh, because he thought it was a distraction from concentrating his spiritual life on deepening his relationship with the Lord Jesus. Enter Jan Tiranovsky once again, because in addition to giving Wojtyla the works of John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila to read, uh, Jan Tiranovsky gave young Karol Wojtyla a book by the 17th century French theologian Louis de Montfort called True Devotion to Mary. And from that book of Louis de Montfort, uh, Wojtyla learned something very important. It all goes back to the last recorded words of Mary in the New Testament. What are, what are the last recorded words of Mary in the New Testament? Well, it's the wedding feast at Cana in the beginning of St. John's Gospel. And what are the last words that Our Lady says in, in uh, the New Testament? Do whatever he tells you. Now, uh, preachers uh, working with that text often concentrate on the whatever because this was, as the Gospel said, the first of his signs, and his disciples began to believe in him. What Louis de Montfort taught Carol Wojtyla, the future Pope John Paul II, is that the really crucial word in do whatever he tells you is the pronoun, he. Mary's task, Mary's role, 
in what we call the economy of salvation is always to point to her son. Do whatever he tells you. And by pointing us to her son, who is both son of God and son of Mary, Mary points us to the two central mysteries of Christian faith, the Incarnation and the Trinity. The second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, the Word of God through whom all things were created, became incarnate, was enfleshed in the womb of a young Jewish girl, Mary of Nazareth. So all true devotion to Mary is Christocentric, Christ-centered, do whatever he tells you, and Trinitarian. Moreover, uh, Wojtyla came to understand from Louis de Montfort that uh, Mary is the paradigm, the model, the template of all Christian discipleship. We see this, first of all, in the Gospel of Luke, where Mary responds to the angel's rather astonishing <laughs> Uh, announcement that you are going to be the mother of the Messiah by saying, let it be done to me according to your word. In Latin, fiat voluntas tua, may your will be done. That's the paradigm or the template for all Christian discipleship. Let it happen to me according to the will of God. Mary's articulated fiat in the Annunciation, be it done unto me according to your word, is then complemented at the end of the life of the Lord on Calvary, where in the 13th station of the cross, Mary accepts into her arms the dead body of her son, uh, most memorably captured in Michelangelo's uh, extraordinary sculpture of the Pietà. That's the silent fiat. There's the articulated fiat in the Annunciation and the silent fiat at the foot of the cross. That is the paradigm of all Christian discipleship. That led in Carol Wojtyla, Pope John Paul II, to a great spirituality of trust. At Czestochowa in 1979, during his epic first pilgrimage to Poland, John Paul II I am, said, I am a man of great trust. I learned to be one here. I learned to be a man of great trust in contemplating, meditating on, praying with the great icon of, of the Black Madonna, who is herself the embodiment of trust in the will of God, and thus the first of Christian disciples. Fourth, uh, John Paul II, Carol Wojtyla, had what I would call a dramatic soul. In that same vocational memoir I mentioned a moment ago, Gift and Mystery, uh, Wojtyla tells us that when he came to Krakow from the Agalonian University in 1938, he was, quote, obsessed with the theater. He was a man of the theater. He had been writing plays since he was a teenager. He acted on stage during the war, of course. He would become a member of what was known as the Rhapsodic Theater, a cultural resistance group to the Nazi occupation. And it's certainly true that John Paul II learned some skills from his days on stage. He was a great public speaker. He knew how to articulate. Clearly, he had a tremendous sense of timing uh, in his public uh, presence. But Wojtyla got more than a skill set, as we say, from his uh, dramatic experience, from his theatrical experience. He got a way of looking at life. And he came to understand that each of us lives in a drama. The drama is life in the gap, the space, between the person I am today and the person I ought to be, the person I am called to be. That's the drama of the spiritual life. That's the drama of the moral life. And that's a dramatic situation. The human life, each one of our individual lives, is structured like a drama. Uh, 
those of you who have been to London know that on that vast 450 mile uh, underground system, the London subway, there are signs every six feet that say, mind the gap. This is simply telling you not to put your foot between the train and the platform. Mind the gap is in fact a description of the spiritual life, the moral life, as John Paul II understood it. We live in that gap between who I am today and who I should be, who I ought to be, whom I'm called to be, and that's a dramatic situation. That's a dramatic situation. And the effort, with the help of God's grace, to close that gap is the drama of every individual uh, life. Each of our lives is playing within a cosmic drama that has God as its author, its director, and through the incarnation, its protagonist. God enters the drama of human history in the person of the Son to direct human history back to its true course. So a dramatic soul. Fifth, I would say John Paul II had a, dram had a lay soul. Now this, is, this sounds a little strange. There was no more priestly priest than John Paul II. But let's remember that this was the first pope in a very long time who uh, at first intended to live his Christian life as a layman. Again, in that book, Gift and Mystery, Wojtyla tells us that he really struggled with the idea that he might be called to the priesthood. This was a real wrestling match in his life. And out of that wrestling, which of course ended up in his recognition that he had indeed been called to the priesthood, nonetheless he carried with him throughout his priestly life a deep respect for the lay vocation in the world, which is how he had originally intended to live his Christian life. Lay people are called to sanctity. Everyone in the church is called to sanctity. Sanctity, holiness, is not a matter for the church sanctuary alone. The whole point of the Christian life is to sanctify the world. John Paul II understood that 20 years before the Second Vatican Council, wrote the idea of a universal call to holiness into its dogmatic constitution on the church, Lumen Gentium. So a lay soul in which the vocation of lay people is to sanctify the world, empowered by their priests and bishops to do so, that, that's very much part of the rich interior life of John Paul II. In the sixth place, I would say John Paul II had an apostolic soul. Uh, that's obvious in a sacramental sense in that he was ordained on September 22, 1958, as a bishop, thus making him a successor of the apostles. But he had an apostolic soul long before he was a successor of the apostles, because he understood that that universal call to holiness, which I just mentioned, has to be lived in service. And the greatest service the church does for the world is to tell the world its true story or remind the world of its true story. Now, in history classes, when we're young, we learn one way of reading history, of telling the story. Ancient civilizations, Greece and Rome, the Middle Ages, Renaissance and Reformation, uh, the Enlightenment, the Age of Science, the Age of Revolution, the Space Age, those are the chapter headings. And that's true. But that's history read on the surface. That's the world understood on the surface. What the church tells the world, what Wojtyla reminds the world, John Paul II reminds the world, is that there's a deeper story. And its chapter headings are creation, fall, promise, prophecy, incarnation, redemption, the kingdom of God. 
That story does not run parallel to the story we learn in the history books. It's what's going on inside the world story as the history books tell it. It's the inner dynamic of human history. And that is what the apostolic work of the church is, to remind the church to teach the world its true story, which is often best done by example. Not so much by argument, but by witness. Think, for example, of the witness of a great spiritual friend of John Paul II, St. Teresa of Calcutta, Mother Teresa. Finally, in the seventh place, I would say John Paul II had a humanistic soul. And I mean that in the sense that he understood that the great challenge of our time, the great crisis of our time, was in the idea of the human person. False ideas of who we are, where we came from, how we should live with others, what is our ultimate destiny, had made a terrible wreckage of the 20th century. Hundreds of millions of people dead, ultimately because of false ideas of the human person. John Paul II dedicated his pontificate to teaching the truth about who we are, where we came from, how we should live with others, what is our ultimate destiny, by reference to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ reveals both the face of the Father of mercies, as in the parable of the prodigal son, but Christ also reveals the truth about us. In meeting the Lord Jesus, we meet both God and the truth about God and the truth about who we are. That's a humanistic soul. So, a Polish soul, a Carmelite soul, a Marian soul, a dramatic soul, a lay soul, an apostolic soul, a humanistic soul, a great soul, a great souled man given by Poland to the world. Thank you.